With the 2018 World Cup in Russia not far away, fans of all 32 countries qualified will all be wondering if this is their year to become the champions of the world. From Brazil to Belgium, Panama to Portugal and England to Egypt, all the 32 countries will be dreaming of being in the final on the 14th of July. For some of these countries, like Panama, this will be the first ever World Cup. For others, like England, it is one of many World Cups that they have competed in. In this series, I'll be looking into the history of the World Cup of some of these countries, seeing how they have done in every World Cup, the best and worst moments in their World Cup history, famous World Cup players and more. Starting first with a series of videos on my home country, England. In this first part, we will look into the World Cups between 1930 and 1958 to see how England performed in those, as well as some of the stories behind these results. The first World Cup was held in 1930 in Uruguay, with 13 teams taking part and host Uruguay beating Argentina 4-2 in the final to become the first world champions. England, however, were not involved and neither were they involved in the next two World Cups in 1934 and 1938, both won by Italy. The next two planned World Cups in 1942 and 1946 were then cancelled due to the small matter of World War II. Throughout all of these World Cups, England and the other home nations had declined the offers to attend. This was down to the fact that the home nations all decided to leave FIFA on the 17th of February 1928 due to differences of opinion about the definition of amateur status and general disagreement about the powers of FIFA. During the next 18 years, the four home nations would compete against each other in the British Home Championship, which many considered to be the real test at the time. The four British FAs took on a virtual membership with FIFA, where FIFA officials would attend home championship matches and international friendlies would take place. England enjoyed some success in the friendlies, beating and drawing double world champions Italy and beating Germany in 1935 and 1938, as well as beating a rest of Europe team in 1938 at Highbury to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the FA. The 1938 match against Germany was more famous for what happened before the match, as England players were ordered by the British Foreign Office to perform a Nazi salute before the match, as the political situation between Britain and Germany was now so sensitive it needed only a spark to set Europe alight. Despite much protest from the England players, all but one player, Stan Cullis, who was dropped from the squad, did the salute before the game, which England went on to win 6-3. Over a year later, Germany invaded Poland and World War II began shortly after. FIFA did attempt to get the home nations to attend the first three World Cups, despite not being members of FIFA, but they were unsuccessful. Their reason for inviting the British teams, and especially England, was to increase the credibility of their tournament. However, the invites were all successful in 1930, partly due to the logistics of travelling and competing in a World Cup in South America in 1930, with only four European countries actually making the journey in the end. FIFA were unsuccessful again in 1934, where they even offered direct entry into the competition and expenses paid to cover travel and accommodation for England and Scotland, but both declined the offer. Interestingly, both countries ended up going on post-season tours that same year, of England beating Hungary and losing to Czechoslovakia, who both went on to feature in the World Cup a couple of weeks later. A similar method was tried by FIFA in 1938, in addition to the offer of entering a united British team, but this was rejected as it considered to potentially set a precedent for future involvement for the home nations and possibly end the independence of the four British FAs. England once again went on an end-of-season tour in 1938, including the aforementioned Germany match, as well as beating France 4-2 in the stadium which hosted the World Cup final in Paris later that year. Just nine days before the tournament began, the attendance of 65,000 for the match was also bigger than the attendance of any match at the World Cup that year. Eventually, at the FIFA Congress in Luxembourg on the 25th of July 1946, the first of the post-war era, the four British associations all officially rejoined FIFA. In the same year, England appointed their first dedicated team manager, Walter Winterbottom, who was still the youngest and longest serving manager of England, although he had no say in the team selections, which was done by a committee. The 1949-1950 British Home Championship became a World Cup qualifying event. 
with the top two teams qualifying for the World Cup. The white shirts triumph over Wales in a manner that almost guarantees them a World Cup appearance in Brazil. England beat Wales 4-1 in Cardiff and beat Ireland 9-2 at Main Road in Manchester to guarantee a top two spot before beating Scotland 1-0 with a Roy Bentley goal at Hampden Park in front of over 130,000 fans to finish top of the group with Scotland second, Wales third and Ireland fourth. Therefore, England and Scotland qualified for the 1950 World Cup. However, Scotland withdrew from the tournament as the chairman of the SFA, George Graham, not the same one that managed Arsenal, has said they would only go to the World Cup if they had won the home championship, not by finishing second. The 1950 World Cup would also be the first cup where the winners would receive the Jules Rimet trophy. To mark Rimet's 25th anniversary as FIFA president, the draw for the World Cup was held on the 22nd of May 1950, with England being a pot one team along with hosts Brazil, Italy and Uruguay. Pot two consisted of Scotland who withdrew, Sweden, Switzerland and Spain. Pot three contained Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay and Yugoslavia and pot 4 contained India, Mexico, Turkey and the United States, but India withdrew due to not being allowed to play barefoot, along with Turkey. England were drawn in Group 2 along with Spain, Chile and the United States, with only the top team in the group qualifying for the final round group, where the remaining four teams would play each other once, with the team top of the group becoming world champions of 1950. The day after the draw, a 21-man squad was announced for the tournament, with an average age of 28.5 years, with Stanley Matthews at 35, the oldest, as well as the most capped player. The squad included the likes of Tom Finney, Stan Mortensen, Jackie Milburn, Billy Wright as captain, and a certain Alfred Ramsey at right back. Neil Franklin, a defender, described by Tom Finney as the best centre half he'd ever played for or against, declined his place in the World Cup squad in order to go and play in Colombia where he earned £60 a week and a massive £2,000 signing on fee, which over four times the maximum wage allowed in England at the time. He never played for England again. At the same time as the World Cup, the FA arranged a goodwill tour of Canada, showing their ambiguous side to the World Cup at the time, meaning that some players, including Stanley Matthews, turned up late to Brazil and missed the first match. The England squad flew out to Brazil on Monday the 19th of June on a 31 hour journey, with their first game of the World Cup happening on Sunday the 25th of June, less than a week later. England went into the tournament as one of the favourites, even being described by the Brazilian press as the kings of football. Two days before England's first game against Chile, the starting 11 was announced. The main shock was a debut for Laurie Hughes, replacing his Liverpool clubmate Bill Jones at centre half. Sunday, 25th of June 1950, was England's first game at a World Cup, played at the Maracanã, while Spain played USA in Curitiba in the other game in the group. Despite a poor start, Stan Mortensen opened the scoring in the 39th minute with a header from a James Mullen cross, becoming the first World Cup goal scorer in English history. Chile then hit the woodwork twice and were lucky not to equalise, before England hit the bar twice as well. England sealed the game in the 51st minute with a Wilf Mannion goal from a Tom Finney cross to make it 2-0, which was the final score, getting England off to the perfect start. In the other game in the group, Spain beat the USA 3-1. The next game for England on Thursday 29th of June was against the United States, and this would go down in history, but not for the right reasons for England. England remained unchanged from their last game, despite having Stanley Matthews available after flying over from the Canada Tour. The selection committee decided to rest him for more difficult opponents later on. The American team were mainly a semi-professional team, with some of the players having jobs as high school teachers, postmen and dishwashers. We certainly didn't entertain any ideas we were going to beat them, you know, but we figured we could give them a, you know, a battle for it. They had been given odds of 500 to 1 to win the tournament, with many saying those odds were too nice on them. They only trained once as a team before going to the World Cup, and added three non-US citizens to the squad before the game. One of these includes Scottish-born Ed McIlvenny, who was given the captaincy of the game, who also took the throw-in, which led to the only goal of the game. Walter Barr took a speculative shot from 25 yards out, which had no chance of going in, until it took a big deflection off Joe Gatchens, a Haitian-born non-US citizen, who wrong-footed Burt Williams in goal and gave the USA a 1-0 lead. Despite this, England had dominated the game up to that point and continued to dominate after the USA went ahead, but they just couldn't score, with the woodwork being hit by England an incredible 11 times. 
England also had a goal disallowed for an infringement and at least two strong penalty claims denied, including one after Stan Mortensen had broken through the US defence, only for defender Charlie Colombo to take him down with a two-armed shoestring tackle. However, the referee gave a free kick, not a penalty, and was even heard telling Colombo they had done a good thing by stopping the attack. Furthermore, appeals that the ball had crossed the line before the American goalkeeper had tipped it away from a Jimmy Mullen header were denied by the Italian referee Generoso Di Tilo. This would not be the first time a did it cross the line conversation was had in an England game at the World Cup, as you will find out later. It could have finished 2-0 as well if it wasn't for a sliding goal line clearance from Alf Ramsey. Frank Borgie, the goalkeeper for the United States, had the best game of his life, making save after save and denying England any goals, and it finished 1-0 to the United States in one of the biggest shocks in World Cup history. Three days later, on Sunday the 2nd of July, England faced Spain, who had won their first two games of the group, meaning England needed to beat Spain to go level on points and force a playoff, which was how the group winner would have been decided instead of goal difference. England made four changes, bringing in Stanley Matthews and Jackie Milburn, as well as giving debuts to Eddie Bailey and Bill Eckersley. Once again, England dominated the game, but couldn't score, with the Spanish goalkeeper pulling off some good saves. The Spanish side were obsessed with underhand tactics and they constantly fouled the English players, much to the annoyance of the Brazilian crowd. Jackie Milburn scored in the 12th minute of the game, however, it was controversially ruled out for offside. At half-time, Brazilian radio commentators even agreed that England were playing the best football scene during the tournament. Early on in the second half though, Telmo Zara scored the only goal of the game for Spain to make it 1-0, which would be how the game would end, knocking England out of the World Cup in the group stage. England finished second in the group, behind Spain in first, whilst Chile finished third after beating the USA 5-2, who finished bottom. Spain were going to finish bottom in the final round group, which was won by Uruguay after beating Brazil 2-1 in the final game at the Maracanã, with the match renamed by some as the Maracanazo. England came into the tournament as one of the favourites to win, with one of the most golden of generations that England has ever produced, but it wasn't enough, winning just one match, scoring just two goals and going home empty-handed. The year after the 1950 World Cup, England finished runners-up in the 1950-1951 British Home Championship, with Scotland finishing first. England managed to win the next two home championships, sharing the first with Wales and the second with Scotland. The 1953-54 Home Championship once again doubled up as a qualifying group for the 1954 World Cup, with the top two teams qualifying for the World Cup in Switzerland. England started just like the last qualifying group away at Wales, and the same scoreline happened, with England beating Wales 4-1. Although Wales went ahead in the match before England scored four goals in eight minutes to get the win. And it's Lofthouse again who heads it home. England 4, Wales 1. And that's how it stands right up to the end. After playing Wales, England drew 4 all against the rest of the world team at Wembley to celebrate the 90th anniversary of the FA, before defeating Northern Ireland 3-1 at Goodison Park to guarantee a top two spot in the group and therefore a place in the World Cup. Their next game, a home friendly against Hungary, was one of the most famous friendlies in international history, which took place on Wednesday, the 2nd of November 1953, at Wembley Stadium. It was dubbed as a match of the century by the British press, with Hungary coming in as the number one ranked team in the world, current Olympic champions, and unbeaten in 24 games stretching back to May 1950, over three years ago. The English FA had become complacent, assuming that they were technically and physically superior to their foreign counterparts, using the outdated WM formation and ignoring coaching and tactical advances that came from abroad. Hungary on the other hand were using a 2-3-3-2 formation, with players such as Sandor Kozik, Nandor Hidakuti and captain Ferenc Puskas, a short and overweight player who never used his right foot but scored 83 goals in 84 internationals and is widely considered to be one of the best footballers of all time. Hungary went on to win the match 6-3 with a hat-trick from Hidakuti, Two goals from Puskas, including a drug back just before his first goal, which won look out of place in the modern game, and one goal from Josef Bosic. Sir Bobby Robson was quoted as saying, That one game alone changed our thinking. We thought we were demolish this team, England at Wembley. We are the masters, they are the pupils. It was absolutely the other way. Six of the England team, including Alf Ramsey and Stan Mortensen, never played for England again. After this humiliating defeat, England took on Scotland at Hampden Park in the final game of the Home Championship, 
where they were gained some pride by winning 4-2 and finishing top of the group to win the championship. Before the World Cup, England would once again play Hungary, this time in an away match at Budapest on Sunday the 23rd of May 1954. This game was even more embarrassing for England than the previous encounter however, as England went on to lose 7-1, their biggest defeat of all time, which is a record that still stands. This confirmed to English football that England were no longer a major footballing force, and that England needed to look into the coaching and tactics and the improvements being made abroad in those areas which they had previously ignored. Despite these losses, England were one of eight seeded countries out of 16 qualified for the 1954 World Cup and were in pot two along with Austria, West Germany and Yugoslavia. Pot one included the host Switzerland, Uruguay, Brazil and Hungary. Pot three contained France, Italy, Czechoslovakia and Turkey and pot four contained Belgium, Mexico, South Korea and Scotland. England were drawn in Group 4 with Switzerland, Italy and Belgium, with England and Italy being the seeded teams. The 1954 World Cup had unique rules, with no seeded teams playing each other in the groups, meaning every team only played two games per group, with the top two teams going through to the quarterfinals. In addition, if a game was drawing at full time, the game would go into extra time, and if the game was still a draw at extra time, the game would finish as a draw. Lots would be drawn if the top two teams in the group had the same number of points, and a playoff would take place if the second and third place team had the same number of points. The knockout stages were then split into two sections, one section with all the group winners and one section with all the second place teams, with the winner of both sections playing each other in the final. A 17 man squad to travel to Switzerland was announced on the 3rd of June, with five reserve players who would be on standby in England announced on the 8th of June. All bar three of the 17 players made an appearance in the World Cup. Only four of the players from the 1950 squad made the 1954 squad. Tom Finney, Billy Wright, James Dickinson and Stanley Matthews, now aged 39. The squad also contained three uncapped players, Edward Bergen, Kenneth Green and Bill McGarry. The starting lineup for their opening game against Belgium was announced on the 11th of June, with the squad arriving in their base for the tournament in Lucerne three days later. Thursday 17th of June 1954 was the day of England's first game of the 1954 World Cup against Belgium in Basel and it was a high scoring affair. Belgium took the lead in the 5th minute before Ivan Brodis and Nat Lofthaus made it 2 on to England at half time. Brodis then scored again in the 63rd minute following a piece of Stanley Matthews magic before goals in the 67th and 71st minute for Belgium made it 3 all which was how it ended at full time. So the game went into extra time. Nat Lofthaus quickly scored in the start of extra time, but the lead didn't last long as Jimmy Dickinson headed in an own goal and the game finished 4 all at extra time, leaving both teams on one point in the group. Host Switzerland managed to beat seeded Italy 2-1 in the other game in the group to go top. It would be Switzerland who England would play in the second and final game of the group on the 20th of June in Bern. Injuries to Stanley Matthews and Nat Lofthouse meant they had to be replaced with James Mullen and Dennis Wilshaw. There was also an England debut for Bill McGarry who replaced Sidney Owen. In searing hot conditions, goals for the enforced substitutes Mullen and Wilshaw gave England a 2-0 win to secure them top spot in the group after Belgium lost 4-1 to Italy. This left Italy and Switzerland on the same number of points leaving a playoff between the two and Switzerland were once again successful winning 4-1. The draw for the quarterfinals took place on the 21st of June and England were drawn against either one of Brazil, Hungary and Uruguay, who were the other winners of the groups. In the end, England drew Uruguay, the winners of the 1950 World Cup, with the winner of that match to play the winners of Brazil versus Hungary in the semi-finals. The match took place on Saturday 26 of June in Basel. Nat Lofthouse and Stanley Matthews both recovered from injuries to play in the match, replacing James Mullen and Thomas Taylor. The conditions were once again sweltering and England went 1-0 down after 5 minutes but equalised through a Nat Lofthouse goal in the 16th minute to level the scores. England came close to taking the lead but it was Uruguay who were the ones to take the lead in the 39th minute with a 25 yard scream from Obdulio Varela, although England's keeper Gilbert Merrick could have done better. Uruguay then went on to score early in the start of the second half and despite Tom Finney scoring to make it 3-2 and coming close twice to equalising. Uruguay scored again in the 78th minute to make it 4-2, which was how the game finished. Despite England putting on their best performance of the tournament, it wasn't enough and they were knocked out in the quarterfinals, although they could leave with their heads held high after performing much better in Switzerland than they had in Brazil in the previous World Cup. 
The World Cup was eventually won by West Germany, who amazingly beat Hungary 3-2 in the final, after losing an incredible 8-3 to them in the group stages, with the final being known in Germany as the Miracle of Bern. There was a staggering 140 goals scored in just 26 games in the tournament at a rate of 5.38 goals per match, the highest ever at a World Cup. Qualifying for the 1958 World Cup was slightly different to the last two World Cups that England had qualified for. Instead of qualifying through the home championships, England had to qualify through a separate group alongside the Republic of Ireland and Denmark, with only the top team in the group qualifying. Seven months before their first qualifying match, however, England took on Brazil in a friendly at Wembley on Wednesday the 9th of May 1956, where 100,000 people saw England beat Brazil 4-2 which included two missed penalties by England and two goals on debut by 22-year-old Colin Granger for England. England started their qualifying campaign on Wednesday the 5th of December 1956 at Molyneux against Denmark, who had lost against the Republic of Ireland 2-1 in Dublin in their first game. England won the match 5-2 with a hat-trick from Tommy Taylor and two goals from Duncan Edwards. They continued this good form into their next match where they beat Republic of Ireland at Wembley 5-1 on Wednesday the 15th of May 1957, with another hat-trick from Taylor and two goals from John Atio, leaving England on four points, Republic of Ireland on two points and Denmark on no points. Exactly a week later, England faced Denmark for the second game of the group in Copenhagen. Tommy Taylor only managed to score twice in this game and goals from Johnny Hayes and John Atio helped England to a 4-1 victory. This game was also the last time the great Stanley Matthews ever played for England at the age of 42 years and 104 days old. This meant that a draw or better against the Republic of Ireland four days later would guarantee that England would finish top of the group and qualify for the World Cup. The match started badly for England though, as Alf Ringstead scored after three minutes for Republic of Ireland to go 1-0 up. Fortunately for England, John Attio scored his fourth goal in three games for England in the 89th minute to give England a 1-1 draw and send them to the 98 World Cup. What's remembered more about Daly Mount Park was the silence of when they scored. As he said, you could hear it down in O'Connell Street. I think it was Phil Green who said on radio commentary, or his reportatives said, and the silence could be heard in Nelson's Pillar. And it de definitely was a silent, uh, very, very silent ground on that occasion. <laughs> you could have heard a pin drop, really. The reward for John Attio for helping England to qualify for the World Cup was he never got to play for England again. The 1958 World Cup format changed slightly from the last World Cup. There would be no seeded teams. Teams would be put in pots by geography over ability. Every team would play every other team in the group, three games per team. First place teams would play second place teams in the quarterfinals. And if there was a tie for points for the top two teams, it would go down to goal average instead of a lot. England were put in the British pot alongside Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland and this is the first and only time all four British teams have qualified for a World Cup. The other pots were a Western European pot containing hosts Sweden, West Germany, Austria and France, an Eastern European pot containing Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, and an America's pot containing Argentina, Brazil, Mexico and Paraguay. England were drawn in Group 4 along with Austria, Soviet Union and Brazil. However, a few months before the World Cup, disaster struck. On Thursday the 6th of February 1958, British European Airways Flight 609 crashed on its third attempt to take off from a slush covered runway at Munich Airport, West Germany. This is more commonly known as the Munich Air Disaster. On the plane was the Manchester United squad who were coming home from the second leg of their 1958 European Cup quarter-final against Red Star Belgrade where they qualified for semi-finals. 23 people died as a result of the crash, including eight Manchester United players. Duncan Edwards injured, Bill Fuchs injured. Mark Jones killed. Ray Wood injured. Eddie Coleman killed. David Pegg killed. Dennis Violet injured, Tommy Taylor killed. Roger Byrne killed. Bill Whelan killed. John Berry injured. Roger Byrne, Tommy Taylor and Duncan Edwards were all established England players who passed away as a result of the crash, as well as David Pegg who had recently made his England debut and had been tipped to replace Tom Finney. Mark Jones and Eddie Coleman, who had been tipped to be picked by England in the future, also died. Johnny Berry, 
who had won four caps for England, survived, but was injured too badly and never played football again. This devastated both Manchester United and England and reduced England's chances of winning the World Cup later that year. Less than a month before their opening game of the World Cup against the Soviet Union, England faced the same opponents in a friendly in Moscow on the 18th of May, where England drew 1-1 after going 1-0 up. On the 28th of May, England announced their squad for the tournament. Only Billy Wright and Tom Finney survived from the last World Cup squad, meaning they had made the last three England World Cup squads. Also in the squad was a young Robert Charlton, also known as Bobby Charlton, and Robert Robson, also known as Bobby Robson, and five uncapped players. The England squad arrived in Sweden on the 5th of June, just three days before England's first game in the tournament. England upped their World Cup campaign in 1958 against the Soviet Union, who they had recently played in a friendly and drawn 1-1. However, the England team who had played in this match was much changed from that friendly. England went 2-0 down after 55 minutes and it looked like England were going to lose their first match of the tournament. However, Barry Douglas set up Derek Kevin to make it 2-1 and with 5 minutes to go, Tom Finney scored a penalty to make it 2-2. The Soviet Union keeper, Lev Yashin, grabbed the referee after the goal, furious with the decision to award a penalty as he believed the tackle was outside the box and he was lucky not to be sent off. Just before the game ended, Tom Finney received a crunching tackle which damaged his knee and ruled him out for the rest of the tournament and the game finished 2 all. The other game in the group saw Brazil beat Austria 3-0 and it was Brazil who were the next team England would face on Monday the 11th of June with the Brazilian squad containing the likes of Garincha and a young 17 year old attacker called Pelé although neither played in the match against England. Bill Nicholson, the assistant to England manager Walter Winterbottom had watched Brazil take on Austria and worked out some defensive tactics for England to use in their match against Brazil and it worked out perfectly as England kept a clean sheet by not allowing Brazil into a rhythm and using Bill Slater to stick to Brazil's playmaker Didi to stop him producing some of his devastating passes. England also failed to score as well with the match finishing 0-0. The first ever 0-0 in a World Cup match in history, Soviet Union beat Austria 2-0 in the other match to leave Brazil and Soviet Union on 3 points, England on 2 points and Austria on zero points going into the final group games. England played their final group game on Friday the 15th of June against Austria. They needed to avoid defeat to stand the chance of progressing to the quarter-final. England started with the same lineup from the Brazil game, with the only change all tournament up to then being Alan Acor replacing the injured Tom Finney for the Brazil game. England went behind early in the first half thanks to a 30-yard screamer from Carl Collar and the scoreline stayed the same until early in the second half when England equalised through Johnny Hayes. Austria regained the lead later in the second half with another long shot, this time through Alfred Kerner. Once again however, England equalised to make it 2 all, and with a few minutes to go, Bobby Robson thought he had scored the winner. However, the referee disallowed the goal, ruling that Derek Kevin, England's scorer of the second goal, had obstructed the keeper. The match ended in a draw and with Brazil beating the Soviet Union 2-0, England would have to face the Soviet Union for the third time in a month in a playoff on Tuesday the 17th of June to decide which team would go through to face the host Sweden in the quarterfinals. England made three changes to their starting lineup, with Ronald Clayton, Peter Brabrook and Peter Broadbent replacing Edwin Clamp, Brian Douglas and Bobby Robson with the surprise admission of Bobby Charlton. The game was goalless at half time, although Peter Braybrook, making his debut for England, hit the post in the first half. Braybrook then also had a goal disallowed in the second half. When the Chelsea man does get the ball in the net, the goal is disallowed for handball. Before the Soviet Union took the lead with a shot that went in off the post, unlike Ray Brooks in the first half, and the game would finish 1-0 to Soviet Union, knocking England out of the World Cup in the group stage without winning a single game in the tournament. The first time this had happened in England's World Cup history. In the final, Brazil beat host to win the World Cup for the first time, after coming so close in 1950. 17-year-old Pelé scored twice in the win. The tournament also saw Frenchman Just Fontaine score an incredible 13 goals in just 6 games, which is still a World Cup record for most goals scored in a World Cup by an individual. England did not enjoy the best of luck throughout the tournament, with 2 goals disallowed, which would have made the difference to the outcome of the group, as well as hitting the post twice in the playoff against the Soviet Union. Despite this, the failure to pick Bobby Charlton was seen as a negative by the press, although how much of a difference that would have made to the final results, we will never know. Thanks for watching. 
If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and subscribe for more World Cup videos in the coming weeks. And click the bell to make sure you receive every notification. Let me know in the comments if you were alive when any of the World Cups were on. And if you have any stories. And if you weren't born, let me know any of the things you've learnt about those World Cups in the video. Also, if I've missed any crucial stories, let me know as well in the comments below. In the next video, we'll be looking at the World Cups from 1962 to 1974. Including England hosting the World Cup in 1966. The story behind the arrest of Bobby Moore in 1970 and the infamous Jeff Hurst goal against West Germany. Bye for now.